Welcome to the Retail Insider Video Interview Series. I'm your host, Craig Patterson, and we're joined here today with a special guest, Annie Nersessian, founder of VMID. Welcome, Annie. Thank you so much, Craig. Thank you for having me. Now, I'll say for people here watching this or listening that uh, now VMID is a, uh, your retail visual merchandiser. Can you tell me a little bit about your background and how you got started in this? Sure. So I would say I would give my credit to starting at Holt Renfrew. I was the visual team's assistant at Blue, uh, at the Blur location. And then I moved on to the women's wearing cosmetics sections as well as a visual merchandiser at Yorkdale. Um, and then I moved on to the corporate world at Adidas Group Canada, where I was the national VM coordinator there. So I was in charge of training the visual merchandisers all across the country for Reebok and Adidas stores, creating training programs for them and conferences, as well as handling the monthly campaigns and setups inside of the stores. Um, and I loved my role. There was, I know it was a great company love the role. Um, I grew a little bit tired of doing the same thing for the certain types of products. So I ventured out on my own and opened up VMID. I felt maybe I'd feel a little bit more fulfilled than life if I was doing the role that I was doing, but offering it for smaller businesses. And of course, smaller businesses don't necessarily have internal teams to be doing this because they don't have the needs or the budget. Um, so I started by offering these services kind of a la carte being is it internal training that they need? Is it hands-on execution? Is it designing and planning? They could have a little bit or they could have a lot depending on what they need. And of course, as every business goes, you start to kind of cater your packages to where your business is going. So now I offer consultation packages and visual merchandising packages, designing, planning, all sorts of things to get your retail presentation more optimized and elevated to look your best. Oh, that's amazing. Now, um, are, are there places that you get inspired or any trends or tell me a little bit about uh, uh, how visual merchandising is over the years? I know in the 70s, it probably might have looked a little mm -hmm. bit different than, say, today, for example, or maybe not after yeah. what we're seeing in fashion. For sure. So although my clients are typically small to mid-range businesses, I always look to the larger companies to sort of set the stage. So, you know, visiting malls like Yorkdale Mall is very, very inspirational to see where the trends are going. And that doesn't mean that it makes sense for the smaller businesses to look exactly like that, nor does it make sense to plan accordingly, but it does sort of uh, show where people's preferences are aesthetically. VMSD is a, a great source of inspiration as well to see what's happening in other parts of the world. I'm following other visual merchandisers in other parts of the world. I find um, that there's a lot of inspiration in the States. The UK has amazing visual merchandising as well. So taking inspiration from there, but making it make sense for the smaller local independent shops here. Terrific, terrific. I know you've um, been around Canada a little bit here and there. How are retailers doing generally with their visual merchandising? Is, is it mixed uh, when you see some smaller retailers and uh, are they investing in it? Uh, tell me a bit more about that. Uh, definitely mixed. I would say, you know, as everything goes in business, you handle a lot of different hats. So I think business owners that typically see the value in visual merchandising, maybe pay a little bit more attention to it in general. Everybody has so many different responsibilities in retail worlds that it's common that visual merchandising, visual merchandising gets a little bit neglected. Um, and that's to say that maybe the whole um, potential isn't quite there. Um, you know, tweaking it to make it make sense for your customer definitely makes sense. Sometimes we get so caught up in just checking something off that we start treating our stores a little bit more like stock rooms, just to basically saying, Here's the product. I'm going to have it out there. Shop it. But it's not as inspirational. Um, and of course, it's a luxury to really carve out that time accordingly. So it's not easy, I'll say, to really not only carve out the time and have the mental capacity to take that on, but even knowing who and what to delegate it to. So it comes naturally for some people. And some people, I would say, it develops once they start trying different things and seeing the effect on their sales once they are doing the visual merchandising. But I do think that there is room to elevate. Maybe I'm biased because this is my role, but I, I do think that doesn't necessarily need to be such an overwhelming thing to take on. And consumers react to the uh, environment around them, basically, in terms of uh, what you see displayed. Uh, displays, in some cases, can can impact sales. Well, I, I think this has probably been proven at this point, but can impact sales in terms of uh, uh, people noticing things or people wanting to buy things. Is there a bit of a psychology around that? Because I'll admit, like, I, I don't fully understand it. I, I've talked to a few consultants, interviewed them here, but I'm not the expert in this. 
Yeah. So of course, there's one component about grabbing attention. So um, people all automatically think about visual displays when they think about visual merchandising. But another aspect is to create that inviting environment and that space flow, meaning what are what what is the layout like? How is it not only inviting customers in, but encouraging them to walk in further and actually explore around? Or are you doing the opposite and creating barriers or making them feel like, you know, there's a block from the them exploring further. So the space layout comes into play and that affects your navigation, where you're exploring and how much you're shopping. There's the grouping of products as well. Are the zones clear enough to really make it easy to shop or does it feel overwhelming where the customer is not going to pay much attention to the store? They're gonna feel overwhelmed and they're gonna exit. So are the zones clear? Are the products that are grouped together inspiring? Or are they organized or are they too much of one and not the other? So also the balance of how simple the, the uh, product adjacencies are, as well as how inspiring they are. So basically the whole customer navigation comes into play, everything from uh, grabbing their attention right from the window displays, pulling them in, making them walk around further. And once that they are in a zone that has attracted to them, how are they shopping? Are they buying multiple things or are they, they have their mindset on just purchasing one thing, all those certain little things that are enticing them to add on to their purchases. So this is all a part of visual merchandising. This is so interesting. Is it a mix of um, experience and education in terms of learning how to do this? Or uh, tell me a little bit about that because because it, it is interesting to see, you know, how to impact the psychology of consumers by creating interesting displays in stores. I would say it's a mix. So there's definitely value in education, but I find there's nothing like real life experience. And even with some of the in-store visual merchandisers at Adidas that we were training, for some people, you could tell it just came so naturally and they really enjoyed it. So that's, you know, who would kind of focus on developing even further. And maybe there's some things that they hadn't realized to try out. So there's definitely, there's a benefit to education, but there's nothing quite like just testing things out and seeing the impact of it, because we can only assume so much. It is very subjective. So we don't know what truly will work in each setting. You know, every retailer is a little bit different from each other um, until we actually try something out and then seeing how those particular customers are going to react to it. Oh, that makes a lot of sense. And what areas have you worked in in terms of retail? Like you, I'm sure it's fashion retail, but uh, um, it might be a funny question. Uh, grocery stores probably would do this, like say with a display of fruit. That's true. The... Um... Grocery stores definitely need visual merchandising to make it as organized as possible. There have been projects as well for like food markets that uh, BMID, my, me and my, myself and my team have supported in terms of um, staff training so that they can maintain the areas of the food markets, helping them with the actual setup and finessing their spaces to make it more inspirational. And of course, everybody's brand image is different. So even the grocery stores, are they more uh, upscale and elevated or do they want to look just more value driven so that all comes into play in terms of how abundant the product should be how much negative space there is what kind of signage that we're using um, or there was even a project that we had done for Loblaws creating a visual display for their entry point to um, promote a certain campaign so even though grocery stores in general should be very organized and simple in terms of shopping because that's what you want to do in a grocery store, but there's still opportunity for those kind of charming moments to create more excitement and inspiration. Yeah, and it's about the brand generally as well, I think from what you're saying too, uh, that you're evaluating what the brand is and you're trying to reflect that in that display in the store. Exactly, yeah, definitely staying true to the brand because as visual merchandisers, we don't want to be rebranding, but we want to build off what the brand has already created for themselves. Makes a lot of sense. Uh, are there any tools or software that's being used or sketches or, or planograms? Tell me a little bit about the, the process. So it depends on where they are in their business. So when it comes to larger companies, they probably do wanna use a planogram software so that when they're creating a plan, they can translate that to multiple stores at once. So it's you know one effort, then you send it to multiple locations. Of course, every location should have an experienced visual merchandiser so that they know where to tweak those differences where they might not be able to adapt the whole plan 100%. When it comes to a store that maybe just has one location, I wouldn't, you know, they don't need to invest in a planogram software. Even just a simple hand sketch would help so that instead of physically exhausting yourself, moving things around and around until they work, just create a diagram for yourself or pre-plan different setups that are doing well for you. And then you can recycle those ideas and not only delegate it easier, but 
you know, do the planning by hand first before you're actually exhausting yourself with so much product um, so that you can be more efficient with your timing and your planning. I myself, I'm an Adobe person. So I like doing the pre-planning and sketching. Um, not only am I not a good drawer by hand anyways, but to be able to communicate my ideas, I like to use like Illustrator or SketchUp to um, communicate my ideas to the clients. And sometimes that means it's so clear to them that they want to handle it internally and that's fine. Sometimes they might say, you know, I don't have the time to do this, but I approve of the plan. In that case, then we would pull in our, our uh, visual merchandisers to execute the plan. Oh, that is so interesting. Now, uh, I'll bet there's some tight deadlines sometimes, just depending on the time of the year, if there's, you know, moving from one holiday to the next. How, how are the stresses around uh, uh, dealing with some tight deadlines when you got clients that need something done to, uh, yesterday? So, of course, we always want to do everything. But if they tell me they need something next week or, you know, if they we can't possibly do everything that we typically like to do, it means cutting out certain services. So um, if you tell me you need somebody in a few days, then it means getting a visual merchandiser who's so senior that they don't require any guidance. They can simply show up on site, assess what they have to work with and make the most of it. So that's a more senior consulting level. I would call that a VM lead. Uh, the typical VM tier is would be like a senior VM, which means we do the designing and planning in advance and they follow that to plan. You know, one other area we can cut out is the sourcing. You know, we're all at the mercy of shipping uh, shipping timelines. <laughs> so if we don't have enough time to do the sourcing portion, then that means skipping straight to, again, whatever they have to work with. We could still do the, do the consulting and designing, but that means we might not have time to actually order anything to arrive. So there's always a little bit of a sacrifice we have to make when it, when, if we don't have the full schedule that we would like to have. Oh, very interesting. Uh, are there any performance metrics or how, how is success measured uh, in visual merchandising? So the typical way are the UPT. So looking at, um, uh, you know, how many units per transaction there are, what's the average sales, how much traffic they're enticing, what's the conversion rate when customers are in the store. But that doesn't mean that that is everybody's goal. Sometimes it's more about brand awareness. So for example, if there's a pop-up shop, you can't expect me, you know, you might have an amazing week, but if you're only there for a few days, it might not be about the sales you make during those days, but it's more about brand awareness. And you might be able to see the trickle effect of the sales from the pop-up into your online sales. So it depends on what your goal is. Do you need to increase your traffic, your conversion? simple brand awareness? Are you testing how people are shopping? Uh, because it might not be the same goal for everybody. And since I'm not the one seeing the sales directly because my I'm a third party to my clients, it's a matter of talking to the business owners and seeing the impact of what we had done on the behaviors of the customer. So sometimes that's quantitative and that's, sometimes that's qualitative. Very interesting. I think when it comes to quieter times, and I think retail, of course, has been challenging for everybody, but January, February is always trending to be slower. Um, and sometimes we get a little bit in panic mode about what we should do right now. And maybe instead of focusing on what we need to do this at this very moment, it's a good time to kind of reflect on overall in the year, which months did better last year and why was that the case? And just being very observant with their customers, seeing how they're shopping, because I think customers' shopping behaviors and their discussions give us a lot of clues about what's right for us. If there's a common question they happen to ask, whether they're asking you or to their friends as they're shopping, what can we do visually to answer that question better so that it's not such a common question for everybody, especially considering you're likely not going to have one staff member for every single person walking into your store. So if you're busy with one customer, what are we doing so that the rest of the customers who aren't being served are able to shop independently? So in a nutshell, the visual merchandising should help the customers to shop more independently. So I would like to add, I think a lot of people think visual merchandising is all about beautiful window displays and it's such a luxury, it's such an expense, but really it's a part of the retail engine. It has to be able to produce better for you. So it's not a luxury. It's just being mindful about where it makes sense to put your budget. It doesn't make sense to spend thousands of dollars on custom props if you're going to use them for a few weeks, if that doesn't make sense for your business. But it does make sense to invest in the right staff training, for example. Basically, like, where is your return on investment? Where does it make sense to invest? Because it's supposed to be helping 
you to sell better. Makes a lot of sense. This is a fascinating conversation. I think brick and mortar retail continues to be important. Uh, we will have an article coming out for, about ICSC talking about the halo effect uh, where uh, physical stores can drive online sales as well. So thank you so much, uh, Annie, for joining us today. This is uh, Annie Nersestian. You're the founder of VMID, Retail Visual Merchandiser. Thank you for, so much for joining us here today. Thank you so much for having me, Greg. It was absolutely a pleasure. And I'm Craig Patterson. I'm the founder and publisher of Retail Insider Media Limited. I'm also the host of the Retail Insider Video Interview Series. Be sure to subscribe, whether or not you're watching this on YouTube or listening to this on one of our podcast channels. Take care and bye for now.